so I do think they have to adapt, and if they don't, I, I do think distribution co-ops uh, have an obligation to exit, to fulfill their members' expectations and requirements. John, that's what we're formed for the members. And, and this tail wagging the dog that's occurred, right, where the generation transmission co-op is dictating to the distribution co-op what's good for us. It doesn't work anymore. Taos, New Mexico is a rural community that attracts visitors for its beautiful landscapes, winter skiing, and quality of life. The town and surrounding communities will also receive 100% of their daytime electricity from local solar projects starting in 2022 en route to carbon-free electricity in 2030. If that's not enough, the utility serving the area, Kit Carson Electric Cooperative, also launched internet service over fiber optic cables it initially laid to make its grid smarter, and it's now connecting every one of its 30,000 members to high-speed affordable service. I spoke with Kit Carson General Manager Luis Reyes in October 2021 about the member engagement that led to big investments in the local economy. I'm John Farrell, Director of the Energy Democracy Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and this is Local Energy Rules, a bi-weekly podcast sharing powerful stories about local, renewable energy. Without further ado, Luis, welcome to Local Energy Rules. Yeah, thanks, John. It's nice to talk to you again. Now, your cooperative has gotten in the news for all sorts of reasons around clean energy, but one of the things I think most people don't realize is that you've really been at the helm at Kit Carson for a long time. I, I looked up uh, in your bio, and I think you've been there now for over 25 years. I was just kind of curious to start out by asking you, you know, how have things changed for being a rural electric cooperative in, in New Mexico during your tenure? I can imagine that there's a lot of things in terms of technology and, and how things are moving uh, that might be different. Yeah, John, thanks. Yeah, I've been fortunate, actually, to be here at Kit Carson for over 37 years and the CEO general manager for, it's going to be almost 29 years. And so, you know, one of the things that have changed is uh, members' expectations. Co-ops have always been pretty democratically controlled. Uh, We listen to our members. But what I've really seen is members really do not have a problem and more of them uh, speaking of what they want from their from their co-op. So I, I've seen that change. I've seen the change of members that don't remember being without electricity. When we started, you know, there was still enough kind of the old timers that remembered when the first linemen came to the ranch or farm and, and got that one light bulb going. You know, a lot of our members don't remember black and white TV. So much less electricity, you know, it's always been there. And, and I think the other thing that has really been unchanged is really the co-op model uh, and really how it's strengthened going forward doing, during the, this energy transition, during COVID, having local control, having a, a, a say in your local energy supply and what you want from your local co-op. I don't think that's really gone unchanged. In fact, it, it really is a hallmark of the, the strength of the co-op model. And so... As you mentioned on technology, you know, we've gone from analog meters to smart meters, but I think they're all positive changes. They're, they're really all positive changes. And I do think I, I continue to see the co-ops in the forefront of this kind of new energy world we're facing. And we're probably the best equipped to, to address it. I think that's positive for the co-op nation. So when we talked before, Luis, what had been really exciting to me in speaking to you was that the cooperative was on track to get 100% of its daytime electricity from solar by 2022. So there, you and, and working with your members had made a lot of investments, a lot of plans around developing solar. Now, this was a few years ago. Right. I'm curious, are you on track to meet that goal? Can you explain a little bit more about what that means, like daytime electricity, obviously solar energy only available during the day, but like what share of the co-op's overall electricity will come from solar? Give us a little context for that and tell us how the plans are coming along. So, so John... That's true. It, it's always been a goal of Kit Carson and its members. Really, it started at, uh, out as how do we get more solar than we can get today? And, and under the old structure that we were under, we could only gain 5% of our energy from renewable resources. And then, you know, that was kind of uniform and common throughout uh, the co-ops that took power from g and uh, across the, the country. And so, as you may know, at a certain point, our members wanted more from us, so we decided to exit our G&T. And sorry, let me interrupt really quick just for the listeners who don't know the term G&T, but it's a degeneration and transmission co-op. So it's the co-op of co-ops that would 
build the power plants. You might be able to explain it better than I, but just making sure that, that we do explain it. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. So yeah, our generation transmission co-op. So it is a co-op of co-ops who are looking for power. A lot of these generation transmission co-ops were formed in the 50s because no one else wanted to serve uh, electric co-ops and they, they served us well during that time. But as more renewables came to the forefront, more communities wanted local choice. You know, it was Kit Carson's opinion that our that the generation transmission model, as as good as as it was, just couldn't keep up with the changes and the expectations our members had with uh, Kit Carson. And to be honest, we weren't sure if they were able to to make that change. And so uh, we decided to exit from our our generation transmission co-op. It was uh, what I would call amicable. I mean, it was negotiated and we worked out the issues. Uh, we didn't end up in court and uh, we exited with an exit fee. And we had a couple of goals. The first was we wanted more affordable and stable rates. We had just gone through a series of rate increases that we thought were becoming uh, unaffordable. The second is that we wanted uh, our members to choose or our members wanted to choose their power supply or have some options. And one of those options was more solar. And so we exited in 2016. We had had several meetings with our members, but after the exit uh, in 2016, uh, we established a co-op goal of 100% daytime solar. And that we're gonna hit it by 2022, uh, which ironically was the same year that we would finish paying off that big exit fee that we negotiated with a generation transmission co-op. So you fast forward, and we're going to do it with, uh, through, excuse me, we're going to do it through a DER. We're going to distribute it. That may cost a little bit more, but it was the members' feelings that everyone wanted their kind of their solar facility in their community. And so that, that, that will come to benefit us in the future as things evolve, but that was our model. And so fast forward today, we're going to hit that target. Right now, we're about 63%. Uh, daytime solar and finishing our last two big solar projects. The, the last two big projects will come with battery storage. So at the end, we'll have enough solar. We'll have about 41 to 42 megawatts of distributed solar that will match our daytime demand or capacity. And we will probably at the end, John, create uh, generate about 42, per, 42 to 44% of our energy will come from solar. Kit Carson is located in the high in the mountains here, uh, spur off the Rocky Mountains, Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Uh, we're actually a nighttime winter peaker. And so we do, because of the cold weather, we, we're a resort town, a mountain town. We sell a lot of energy at nighttime. Snowmaking is a big driver in the wintertime for the four ski areas that we serve. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the first step in this transition. That would have never happened under the old model. And I think that's important as we are seeing the effects and impacts of, of climate change, uh, the impacts of us not moving quick enough into this renewable energy world. And so the next step is then let's, let's add some storage and then let's, let's start address transportation. And so besides uh, Kit Carson having, uh, we'll hit our goal by June of 2022 to hit that 100% daytime solar. And you know what that really means is when the when the sun starts to come over that horizon and hits that first uh, solar ray on the east side of our system, we start generating electricity. And when it sets in the uh, in the west, and we have a rays in the east, the west, the north, the south, and in Taos, you have solar generation distributed across our territory. Uh, we're generating solar as soon as the sun comes up. And, you know, it's like anything, it's not perfect. We know that there's cloudy days and there's rainy days, and we know that at night it doesn't shine. But we think this is a process and, and technology will catch up. The next step is installing batteries. We think battery technology will evolve to long duration. You know, we, we uh, read and see the research done on hydrogen for base load. And so I think as, as we move into this new world, technology will keep up. And then with the addition of electric vehicles, we're starting to build out our EV charging infrastructure and looking at ways to have EVs deployed in, in, in our territory. 
I think the one of the underlying goals is access to all. You know, in the old kind of old model, outside of the five percent, the only people who really could afford rooftop was those who had some means. And I think that 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 is starting to change. You see more community solar projects. Our system, if you're a member of Kit Carson, you're going to get solar energy uh, because it is it is our it's our primary resource mix. And so we want to take that same philosophy for electric vehicles and, and charging that just because you may not be financially able or your lower moderate income doesn't mean that we, we can't give you opportunities to experience uh, EV transportation, whether it's something you own, uh, whether it's in the secondary market, used cars, or whether it's enhancing or growing public transportation. Again, these are things that John and I say aren't aren't pie in the sky. We actually, if you come to our territory, you can see probably, we've probably done 12 different projects on the solar side. Everything's, uh, you know, from 100 kW to 15 megawatts. Um, we're putting about 15, almost 16 megawatts of storage. So they aren't small batteries. They, they're big enough to, to take us through peak times if we use batteries for peak or for reliability if we have to pick up critical circuits during outages. So we really are on this track to be uh, a carbon free. You know, our goal right now is 2030. As other people shoot to 2040, 2050, uh, we think it's doable much sooner. You know, one of, the, one of the issues when you're the first adopter is it, it, it's a little tougher and maybe a little bit more pricey, but we get to experience benefits sooner. So, so that's where we're at. It, it's been a great journey, and we've we've learned a lot about solar and batteries. We've also learned about a lot about our members and 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 their their requirements, their needs, and how important it is to listen to them. So that's that's you know we're kind of on phase one of this this journey after we've left, and it's really been kind of right now one of the highlights of I think the not just what I've done here at the co-op, but but the co-op itself, and I think nationally what co-ops can do when they decide to engage their members, listen to their members, and then put that plan actually into action. Let me ask you about a little bit more about you left your generation and transmission co-op tri-state and are, are not the only co-op that has done that. And you mentioned that it's because you didn't feel like the model that they had really was adaptable enough to to the interests of your members, like to accelerated deployment of renewable energy and solar. You also had those cost concerns. Do you think that that will change? Do you think that the generation of transmission co-ops, having seen like your co-op, Kit Carson, or Delta Montrose in Colorado, or in other places, will start to shift and give more flexibility to their local co-ops to generate more of their own energy, to offload some of the expensive resources like the coal power that they've had for many, many years? Or do you see other co-ops needing to follow in your footsteps in terms of looking to exit and to go on their own? Just because there are so many co-ops, I mean, there's they serve you know one in seven customers across the country gets their electricity from a rural, rural electric cooperative, but there's really only a handful like Kit Carson or the Kauai Island Electric Cooperative or Delta Montrose that have really set off on the course that you've set. Yeah, so so I do think I do think we have to be real careful when we go forward because there are some co-ops that still feel that the current generation transmission model works for them. I mean, if we're really talking about flexibility, and there's some co-ops that still uh, think that the generation transmission co-op is the best way to aggregate power, uh, then then I, then I think they have to do what what they need to for their members. I, I do, though, see a a growing sense of a lot of co-op members through a lot of co-ops I talk to that do want change, uh, because their members are, as I mentioned, we're not unique in having a a younger demographic. We have a lot of folks moving in from uh, California and New York. So you have this uh, this kind of transformation of urban folks moving into rural areas because they like the, the lifestyle and the quality of life, but they still want the amenities and they want clean air and clean water. So I do think that if the GNTs are going to survive, they're going to have to ad adapt. And I don't think it should be the other way around that the distribution co-op has to adapt. I think we as distribution co-ops created the GNTs, right? The GNTs were a, a product of the distribution co-ops 
a desire to have their own power supply. And so uh, I think if generation and transmission co-ops don't adapt, then you're going to have more co-ops wanting to exit. And I think they're going to want to exit not because the, the, the manager does or the board. It's because the members want flexibility, just as you mentioned. People want choice. What we've experienced here is people want to believe that the renewable energy they're getting is local. So for someone to say you're getting renewable energy, but it's from 500 miles away. It sounds good, but is really get, ever getting here to my to my home. With Kit Carson, you can you can drive a couple of miles away and you can see the solar array that you just follow the lines that goes right to my house. So I do think they have to adapt, and if they don't, I, I do think distribution co-ops uh, have an obligation to exit to fulfill their members' expectations and requirements. John, that's what we're formed for the members, and and this tail wagging the dog that's occurred, right, where the generation transmission co-op is dictating to the distribution co-op what's good for us, it doesn't work anymore. I think the other issue is the generation transmission co-ops policymakers have to make it affordable for 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 distribution co-ops to exit. There can't be this outlandish fees to exit, and I understand, and we. We actually had a kind of key poll. Kit Carson's exit should not cause any distribution co-op to subsidize us. And so I, I think that's important because I don't want anyone to subsidize us as if, if we decide to move a different direction. When you follow what's happening, when you have FERC cases and, and millions of dollars going to lawyers to help so a distribution, uh, distribution co-op wants to leave to meet its members' expectations, I just think that's wrong. I think the GNTs in this case are just wrong to, because at the end of the day, it's the ratepayer, it's the member who pays the legal bill. And so that, I, I don't think that's right. And I think there has to be flexibility. It has to go back to how we were formed, the democratic process. And I think if we don't allow distribution co-ops to really explore what's out there, rural areas will continue to get further and further behind when it comes to energy. Whether because right now the policy, at least in the western states, is to close coal mines, and a lot of coal mines are being closed. And so, if people don't have choice from their co op or their GT, they're going to do it. A lot of people they're going to start putting solar on their home, they're going to start putting batteries on their home and, and make that choice that not every member has, right? That, that right now that's still kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of members. So again, my hope is that the generation transmission will create a model going forward that allows those who want to stay to stay and those who want to exit, exit affordably and, and without a lot of litigation and move on to what we were created was to deliver services to rural Americans. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, I ask for more detail about the benefits of distributing their solar projects. We talk about the cooperative's foray into affordable broadband internet access, and Luis shares his number one recommendation for other rural electric cooperatives. You're listening to a Local Energy Wolves interview with Luis Reyes, General Manager of the Kit Carson Electric Cooperative in northern New Mexico. Hey, thanks for listening to Local Energy Rules. If you've made it this far, you're obviously a fan, and we could use your help for just two minutes. As you've probably noticed, we don't have any corporate sponsors or ads for any of our podcasts. The reason is that our mission at ILSR is to reinvigorate democracy by decentralizing economic power. Instead, we rely on you, our listeners. Your donations not only underwrite this podcast, but also help us produce all of the research and resources that we make available on our website and all of the technical assistance we provide to grassroots organizations. Every year, ILSR's small staff helps hundreds of communities challenge monopoly power directly and rebuild their local economies. So please take a minute and go to ILSR.org and click on the Donate button. And if making a donation isn't something you can do, please consider helping us in other ways. You can help other folks find this podcast by telling them about it or by giving it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. The more ratings from listeners like you, the more folks can find this podcast and ILSR's other podcasts, Community Broadband Bits, and Building Local Power. Thanks again for listening. Now, back to the program. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more, if you're willing, about 
the solar and the fact that it's local, you you know mentioned before that members are interested in kind of being able to see the connection between the solar that's being built in their house that you know in the projects that you've been building in Kit Carson territory are close by. People can drive out and see them and see the see the wires that connect that solar array to their home. Could you talk a little bit, you know, you mentioned that it might have cost a little bit more than say doing one centralized solar array or doing that through a G&T for example. What were some of the things that members were interested in? Are there economic benefits kind of that aren't on the utility bill necessarily that you can account for? Are there things like resiliency or reliability benefits, again, that don't necessarily show up on the bill that were things you were thinking about in building solar out in that way? Yeah. So, John, first, I think it's reliability and resiliency. I mean, we could, if you can control your own power supply. And again, you know, these are these are building blocks. So 44 percent of our energy is local. So during the daytime, if there's a system issue, we can control that. We can continue to deliver energy. Since we live in the mountains, you know, we, we're really concerned about fires, forest fires, and having power lines run through there, and having to shut down power so that uh, firefighters can fight that. With the way we're, we're, we're designing our system, we can actually shut down the, the lines and still have power because of solar and batteries to at least take care of critical infrastructure during those times. So it does bring in, it starts to bring in resiliency, helps us kind of attack these emergencies that come to us. Uh, economic development. Uh, one of the things that we decided is that we were going to build these locally with local contractors. And so we got the local developers in a room, asked them if they, if they could partner together to build it. And four came into the room, three left as partners. And so for the past six years, we've had local people building our arrays, which helps the economy, keeps people working. But we've also been able, these uh, companies now are able to export their skills to other parts of the Southwest. So it's, it's created an economic development. Uh, John, you, you hear a lot from policymakers, even from power suppliers saying, well, they're, they're temporary short-term jobs. Well, they may be, but if you are if you work six months here and six months there and six months, you know, all of a sudden you've worked two years at four different jobs, but it's the same same uh, skill set. That's no different than someone building a house. Once you build a house, you have to move on to the next house and the next house. So construction has always been kind of temporary permanent. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's brought that economic development aspect. It's brought us a, a kind of a marketing tool. You know, if we live in the Rockies and uh, our tourism is based around clean air, clean water, making sure we have uh, sufficient snow to ski, what, what better energy supply than to have solar energy supplying the energy to ski areas and to schools and to businesses? So there is a lot of factors and a lot of benefits in, in building distributed solar because of our grid. You know, if I lost a solar array, let's say on the east side, I can serve it from the west side through our transmission lines. And so it does give me now some redundancy with the solar facilities. It also allows us the ability to island or, you know, we in essence are creating a microgrid. That if we have to, we can isolate ourselves from the main grid at times that we, you know, uh, we may have to. I I think with with, uh, COVID, it's hard to say nothing ever as bad is going to happen, right? Because that really showed us that we're, we're pretty vulnerable to things that we aren't prepared for or don't think will ever happen to us. And I think we have to think that same way when it comes to operating a utility now. You could have a fire that you didn't have before, and how are you going to handle that? You could lose a power plant, and how are you going to handle that? Those things happen. So, yeah, I, I think there's just... It's just not getting clean energy, and it's not getting clean energy that's affordable. It's all these other benefits that the community gains, everything from a resiliency to economic development and everything in between. I think the other thing is creating a model set other co-ops can, can, uh, can look at and take from it the lessons learned. There's some things that, yeah, we probably wouldn't do that, that the same way, Kit Carson, but there's a lot of things we do because we've been successful in deploying this. John, today we probably have, we have about 29 unincorporated communities. So they're not a municipality, it, you know, just little, little communities. 
we have over half them today. And I'm looking outside, it's a sunny day. We already have half of our system already 100% daytime, right? And that's schools and that's churches and that's a post office and that's a health clinic. You know, it, it works. I think that's, that's it, it works. The, the members are satisfied with that energy. The lights aren't dimmer, right? There's not a reliability issue. It works fine. We have it in the north part where we have a lot of irrigation. That solar today is pumping water on the crops. And so it's almost become the rule, not the exception. It's almost if you don't have solar on your house, then I would, when we first started this, my fellow co-ops basically said, you know, we weren't, we weren't the cool kids because who, who does solar? Just Kit Carson and a few hippies. You fast forward to 2022, if you're not doing solar, you're not the cool kids anymore because it has become a very valuable, low cost, reliable resource. That transition actually brings to mind one question I just wanted to ask. You know, one of the goals that you had in exiting your GNT was to be able to do this local solar. It was also in response to affordability issues. You were worried about the rate increases that were coming for your members. I know that you have this exit fee that you're going to be paying off next year. Has it already been more affordable than had you remained members of Tri-State? And what does that look like going forward, especially once you've paid off that fee? So, so John, that's a great question because it, you know that's something that's always kind of misinterpreted. Our, our cost of power today is cheaper than it was when we left Tri-State. So solar costs are down. It is my understanding that after we left, here's, a, here's an amazing little tidbit. When, when we left in 2016, uh, that was a major event for Tri-State and for Kit Carson and really for the, for the co-op world. We paid an exit fee, that was to keep them whole. And we, we had actually had come out of a rate, rate case. Since then though, Tri-State has not had any rate increases up to 2022. And in fact, has had uh, my understanding has had a rate decrease, slight rate decrease. And again, I suspect that with the exit of Kit Carson and the exit of Delta Montrose and the potential discussions of other co-ops wanting flexibility, price stability, and the threat that other co-ops would exit if Kit, if Tri-State did not continue to to raise their rates, because we didn't get we didn't get any big loads that would stabilize that out. There was not a fundamental change in how how Tri-State was operating their system. It's kind of what I said. I think they finally heard what the members wanted, and that was no more rate inc- increases, or we were just going to leave. And we wanted more renewables, or we we're just going to leave. So I, I think they actually became a victim of, if you don't listen to your members, then the members will decide and dictate what's going to happen. So this is a, a good case of where I think Tri-State had to be responsible or forced to be responsive to its members. And for, and for Kit Carson, again, we haven't raised our rates. Our pot cost of power from Guzman Energy is lower than it was with Tri-State. We'll pay the exit. When we pay the exit fee, that will be done basically forever, right? So our members will see a decrease. I think the one area that we really are focusing now is on transmission. Because when you look at the whole energy picture, and you, you want to move renewable energy, let's say solar east and wind west, you need a transmission system to do that. But if the transmission providers are, are, are too expensive, then we, we're back in that same dilemma of not being able to have access to renewable energy because now the transmission uh, system is too expensive. And that's why I think our DER model uh, weathers that because we'll have to take our non-renewables uh, from a transmission but more and more will generate more of our system resources here locally so that we can kind of weather that, mitigate those costs. But we're, we're actually in, a, in, a, in a, a really good position going forward, both on having a lot more renewable resources available to us going forward and also rate stability without jeopardizing reliability. You know, there's a lot of talk from lawmakers and utility companies that going renewable, it's going to be unreliable. We've been, re- you know, it's been really, it's been very reliable. You know, it's, it's kind of talking out of both sides of your mouth when 
you say it's it's unreliable to go to renewable while you're building a hundred megawatt solar facility somewhere, right? It it is reliable. It just I think I think we have to get out of these scare tactics and and say, you know, solar doesn't shine at night, so let's put some batteries or let's get wind that that follows that nighttime profile. And instead of uh, us as co-ops and utilities making excuses why we can't, we should figure how we can. And I think once we get past that hurdle, then I think you'll see a, even a faster adoption of renewable energy. Uh, once we decide uh, we can't fool our members anymore by putting these obstacles in front of them, because our members are pretty sophisticated. They're, they're pretty smart. You know, they formed a co-op. I mean, they, they formed our entity. They have us, you know, yeah, so so I, I think we're in a great position. Everything that we thought we we're going to get out of this exit, we've accomplished. I do think, and again, we're um, kind of scouring all the websites, but I think when, in, in, in June of 2022, we'll probably be the first, at least on the continental unit in the United States, to hit 100% daytime solar, where our energy is coming from resources that are local. You know, it's pretty cool to be one of the first ones to be able to accomplish that. And, you know, we're a small to mid-sized uh, cooperative. We have 30,000 members uh, serving three counties. And, and if we can do that, certainly uh, the bigger co-ops and bigger utilities can do it. I agree. I love that story. And I love the fact that the the leaders in solar, We at one point we're talking about Farmers Electric Cooperative with Warren McKenna. You know, you and I spoke with them. And then I was talking to folks Around Decorah, Iowa, they have an energy district there that's done a lot of investing and helping folks do energy efficiency and solar. And I think they said at one point that in their county, they had more solar per capita than any other place in the country. And it has just been really remarkable to realize that people think that it's urban areas and places with progressive policy that are leading. And I just think it's such a great way to flip that around and to tell people, no, actually, it's it's these rural communities that have you know, the democratic ownership of their systems that have this interest in self-reliance that are really demonstrating to us what is possible and taking advantage of that flexibility that they have. Speaking of that, I'd love to ask you a little bit. I know that we've talked a lot about the clean energy work that you've done, but you've also done some investments in internet service, something that's been common among a lot of rural electric cooperatives as well. I have a colleague here at ILSR who directs a, a program that looks at community broadband networks, and he loves to surprise people by telling them that the internet service they get in the city they live in is probably slower and more expensive than most of North Dakota, where co-ops have made huge investments in that. So I'm really interested to hear what Kit Carson has been doing around broadband, and if you can explain a little bit about how you're able to do that in a way that a lot of other utilities can't be so nimble. Yeah, so so, so John, that, that has been, along with solar, one of probably, and especially during COVID, kind of one of the, the shining stars of, of, uh, of the region is, you know, we started a broadband company, 2000, fixed wireless, just, just because our members didn't have any other choice. Around 2015, about 2008, we started to put fiber between substations so that we could communicate and really start to create a smart grid. So we really want to modernize our grid, be able to utilize smart meters, control substations, you know, all the stuff that utilities uh, should be doing. Uh, then we were able to get a large uh, grant and in 2015. So today we have about almost 3,000 miles of fiber optic that goes past every single customer member we have. We offer gig services. We offer as fast as any competitor in the, in the region. We currently have about almost 11,000 subscribers. And during COVID, we connected schools, did hotspots, started programs basically to connect rural school districts and the, and the students at no cost, just so they could get on. And it really has kind of dovetailed real nicely with the renewable energy world, because we had a lot of people, we have a lot of people moving in from, like you mentioned, urban areas. Because of COVID, they could work anywhere, as long as they had a connection. So people moving here would like to work in the morning and hike in the evening or uh, uh, ski in the morning and do some outdoor recreation in the evening, but they had, they had the gig connection. And so it really helped our schools. We had a lot more schools, uh, students connected or going to school because we had a connection. 
You could tell when you're on a Zoom if you're on Kit Carson or someone else because you didn't have to turn off your video because you didn't have enough bandwidth. And so we had more people working, uh, living here, even if temporary, because they could work in Austin or Dallas or Phoenix or Denver, but they had a better connection here. And, and then the quality of life, right? I mean, you're talking you know, a population of Taos of, of 5,000 versus a population of Austin over a million. During these trying times, the smaller populations made it easier to navigate this COVID world. It's in, and we're trying to create a model. We're actually trying to create a, a model for the north central part of the state that we can connect rural uh, communities on. And you said we have probably faster speeds in neighborhoods than they do in Denver, Colorado. Uh, certainly uh, faster than Albuquerque. And it's affordable. I mean, we, we uh, because of the call model and our basic or first principle is service, not profit. And so uh, we were giving fast broadband speech to students, you know, for 25 bucks. And so they could get 50, 50 megabits up, 50 megabits down for $25. So that three, you know, two, three, uh, four kids and someone on Netflix at the same time. So their world wasn't that much more disrupted because they had to take turns on Zoom or those type of things that you've heard about. And it's really then helped on our our electric because now we have about 90% of our system is smart grid. We collect it and then we can almost in real time get data back to uh, the co-op to help us whether it's on outages, uh, low voltage issues, you know, those those technical issues that a utility uh, historically needs someone to call in to say there's a problem. We almost know instantaneously because we have the meter connected to the fiber connected back to our dispatch center. I mean, it's actually our fastest growing uh, business is, is is broadband. We get requests from even places out of state. You know, they, you just kind of query on fast broadband and Kit Carson internet comes up uh, and we just serve this territory, but it, it's it's really been a great service to the community. And And because John, I don't think, I think a lot of how we do business today is going to stay. I think a lot of businesses are gonna allow their employees to work from home if they have a good connection. That's extremely important in rural areas because now it, they don't they won't lose their jobs if they can get a connection they can keep them uh, they can still you know work and 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 still be the primary caregiver for uh, their kids or elderly parents that are more prevalent in rural areas than urban areas where because we do have extended families right there's you know the families live in one whole community and we take care of each other so I think the other other benefits that people don't think of are, are those types of things of having that connection. It's, it's helped with, uh, besides distance learning, medicine. Now the clinics are, are wired, so people don't have to travel all the way into Taos or, or Albuquerque for a doctor's appointment. You can do it versus video first because your connection is very good. Then, then if you have some issues that a doctor needs to see, you, then you come into the office. So it saves both time and money and peace of mind because you can do it instantaneously so there's a lot of other benefits that this broadband has brought and i think it's i think broadband is going to become a utility just like electric people are not going to uh, tolerate not being without it in fact i probably get more broadband calls if there's an outage than i get electric calls and uh, even though they know you need electricity for broadband some people just haven't connected those dots yet that's okay it, it, and I think it's really, it, it, it's helped us, um, you know, on our exit because uh, when, when it's given us more time since we have to take our own power supply, we're, you know, not being part of a GT really takes a lot of energy. I think I got probably three to five more days of work than having to deal with power supply issues and the politics around power supply that I really cannot pay attention to members and their needs such as a broadband and how to expand those services. I'd love to just wrap up by asking you about how you think other cooperatives can kind of follow in your footsteps and what, what barriers you think they might have to overcome. Obviously having an example is one of the most important things and you have that in terms of both the way that you've done local solar and broadband. Um, what advice do you have for general managers of other co-ops or members of other co-ops 
that hear about what Kit Carson has done? Well, I, I think it's really that member engagement. And I think breaking down the old model of, uh, you know, when you deal with members and give them 10 reasons why we can't do what you just asked us to do. I, I, I think that's foundationally, that's, that's the key. If, if, you, if you visit with your members and you understand what their issues are, really understand, not just hear, hear it to go to a meeting and says a bunch of members want this, and then develop solutions where it's interactive with the member. If it doesn't work, they, they'll understand why, because they've been part of the process. It's when we don't engage them that I think we, we have problems, because then they think that we're hiding something or we don't want to do more work on their behalf. And I think once, John, once you figure that out and don't put excuses why you can't do that, then everything else falls in place, right? But if you don't have a good communication tool uh, with your members, a good rapport, then what generally happens is the members are going to decide to do what they want without you. And and so I, I think that's a key because it, it may be staying with the GNT when it comes to power supply. So it may be the, the reverse where, where you have members saying, hey, let's do what Kit Carson is doing. And after you have a good discussion with the members, they may say, we want to stay. Maybe we're not ready for that yet. So that's what I mean by not put obstacles, because the first thing we do is right away think that they want to leave. Some may not want to leave. They just want to have a good dialogue, you know, to make sure that you're doing, you know, me as a, as a manager is doing what's in their best interest, really not what's in my best interest. And, and I think you do that, then, then anything else you guys want to do, anything from energy efficiency to solar, then becomes actually pretty easy because you have the support of the community. And, and if things don't go well, you have a big support system that you just go back and says, okay, this really didn't work that way. Let's retool and let's do it this other way. And, and I think that's key. It's, it's pretty simple. That's, that's what we did. We just, we just talked to our members a lot. We listened to them probably more than uh, talking and right now they're saying we're not moving our solar fast enough right we we've moved i think pretty fast in 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 five years but that's it's good to have those type of problems right when they're saying you're not putting out broadband fast enough lease or you're not putting out solar fast enough we like what you're doing but you're not doing fast enough those are good problems to have for sure well Luis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me i just find the story of what Kit Carson is doing so inspiring in terms of really living up to the cooperative model, as you say, and being engaged with your members. A really important lesson, I think, for folks who are in the co-op world about how they can do what their members want, whether or not that's, as you say, exactly what you guys are up to or, or something else. So thank you for, again for taking the time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, John. Always nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Local Energy Rules with Luis Reyes, General Manager at the Kit Carson Electric Cooperative, serving communities in northern New Mexico with 100% daytime solar energy starting in 2022. On the show page, look for links to the Kit Carson Cooperative's clean energy and broadband programs, as well as stories about its separation from Tri-State Generation and Transmission Cooperative. On our website, you can also find ILSR's research on rural electric cooperatives, including a 2014 report and several stories and podcasts about the struggles of cooperatives to live up to their democratic principles and several successes. Local Energy Rules is produced by myself and Maria McCoy with editing provided by audio engineer Drew Birschbach. Tune back into Local Energy Rules every two weeks to hear more powerful stories of communities taking on concentrated power to transform the energy system. Until next time, keep your energy local, and thanks for listening.